Our scripture this morning comes from two places, one from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and our second passage is from Matthew chapter 6. I would invite you to stand as you are able in honor of the good news of Jesus Christ. From Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 10 through 15, the author writes, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune so that when they have children, there's nothing for left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. And from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The word of God for the people of God. You all can have a seat. Will you join me as I pray? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. Give us eyes to see the world the way that you see it. Ears to hear your voice. Hearts to receive what you would give us today. And then make us bold as we go out into our world to live as your hands and feet. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Susan began this series last week, Living the Dream, sharing with you that the term American Dream was first coined by an author in the 1930s, James Truslow Adams, who wrote, The American Dream is that of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone with opportunity for each according to ability and achievement. And she pointed out this dream in and of itself is not bad. And it's not a dream that we believe is in opposition to or a contradiction to a God-breathed dream for our lives. But as we often do as humans, we seem to take something good and we twist it just a little. We twist it until it morphs into something completely different than it started off being. And we do this entirely on our own or perhaps, depending on your view of faith, we may have a little help from the father of all lies as sin takes root in our heart and as it grows. And Susan shared with you, she rightly identified that this series really is more of a question-asking confessional than it is an answer-giving condemnation. Because as we planned this series and as we talked about it as a staff, we realized that this really caused us to wrestle internally caused us to wrestle with ourselves and, and, and question our own morals and our own values. And it's not so much a stewardship series about money. I mean, that's part of it. But it's more a series about the condition of our hearts. How do we effectively and efficiently steward all of the resources, all the resources that are entrusted to us? And how do we live into our God-given potential? And then, then how do, do those things add up or align with what we say we believe about God and, and what we read to be true about our faith? And how do we implement that in our lives? 
And for some of you, you, you don't wrestle with this at all. You know, you've reached a point in your life where you say, life is good, I really don't need anything, and it seems like the older I get, I need more. No, I need less and less and less. But we're talking about a dream. And dreams are intended to inspire us, right? They're intended to fill us with hope. And they're supposed to give us warm fuzzies, right? They're supposed to fill us with contentment, a sense of, of bliss, and a sense of peace. I watched a sermon online, and I love the video that Susan shared with you of, of a great-grandmother dreaming of a future for her grandchild great-granddaughter while, while recalling her struggle and her achievements and, and what she had been able to accomplish and the hope that, that would bring this new great-granddaughter. Dreams are intended to inspire us, fill us with hope and bliss and contentment and warm fuzzies. So when you think about living the dream... Living your dreams, are you inspired? Are you filled with hope? Are you content? And are you at peace? For some of you, as you reflect, did you live the dream? Or are you overwhelmed, possibly with worry, and doubts, and fears, maybe with regret. Are you angry? Are you angry? Because you don't ever see yourself living a dream or you don't look back and say, we, it wasn't a dream at all. All it was was a nightmare. Are you disturbed because something or someone has stolen your dream or taken away your ability to dream? Has dreaming just become burdensome because you can't live up to the expectation of the dreams and your dreaming is only given way to worry the American dream is or perhaps was a house a house to call our own a car a white picket fence marriage once 2.5 kids that's statistically what most Americans had at one point. And a good job to pay for it all. That was the American dream. It led to security, and it led to stability. It was, an, as we've talked before, an Aussie and a Harriet. It was a leave-it-to-beaver leave world. But many of us, sadly, would say that world no longer exists, does it? Now the American dream, for some of us, more closely resembles affording a much, much, much bigger house or, or remodeling the one that you currently live in but have yet to pay for so that it matches the made-over homes that we watch on DIY or HGTV or that. Am I the only HGTV junkie? Yeah. yeah. Or upgrading your current furnishings because you want your personal style to be accurately represented when people come into your home, right? And purchasing a car, that used to be a luxury that was a dream. Purchasing a car. But that's no longer an achievement. Now, it's purchasing a new car. And I was perfectly happy with my old car until I saw the new car. And if you can't afford it, they'll finance it. 96 months, 8 years my gosh oh my gosh and everyone gets approved right because we want everybody to be able to afford everything and after all we work hard and we deserve it and kids now dreams you know playing kickball outside or kick the can outside or little league sports that's no longer part of the dream no, now we, we have travel sports year-round and individual coaching lessons and training lessons so that we can continue to better ourselves and compete with the stiff competition. And we have electronic devices, your pastor included, okay, 
that cost hundreds if not thousands of dollars. Designer clothes, bigger, shinier things, first class trips, and the dream gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And as Susan said last week, this is not a condemnation. This is confession. <laughs> I've been there. And at times, if I'm perfectly honest with you, if I don't catch myself, I get quickly caught up. And I'm easily distracted by shiny things. And my focus turns to things that aren't important at all. And that happens to me all too easily. Maybe it doesn't happen to you. Maybe whenever you hear these things, you only look at other people and you say, I'm glad I'm not like them. Pray for us, okay? I'm not here to bash the American dream. Please don't hear that. That's not what I'm hearing to, here to do. Those who seek opportunity to desire a better life, a life filled with comfort and luxuries, because I too have dreams for my children. I want them to get a good education so that they can maximize their earning potential and become productive, contributing members of society. I want my daughters to grab all that life has to offer them. But part of my dream for them is that they learn that the world does not revolve around them. And that they have a God-breathed dream as well. One in which they do not simply live for themselves, but they also live to please their Creator and to be a blessing to other people. The title of today's message is Insanity. Do you know that one person's definition of insanity, and I love this, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again expecting to get different results. Doing the same thing over and over and over again expecting a different outcome the next time. And here's what I believe that the American dream has become. I need to earn more so that I can spend more or so that I can pay for what I've already spent it on. The dream is to earn as much as you can so that you can consume as much as you possibly can. You agree or you disagree? Weird. It was last week. Weird. Today's definition of someone who is weird, not like everyone else, is someone who lives in a paid-for house or an apartment they can afford, a paid-for car, no consumer debt, and they pay cash for everything. That is weird. That's countercultural. Weird is spending less than you make and giving away as much as you can. Being radically frugal and radically generous at the same time. Is that possible to be radically frugal and radically generous? That's weird. That is not normal. I did a bunch of research and looking at consumer debt is at an all-time high. And our national debt is going up in the trillions each year. And this is not a political sermon, so please don't take it that way. And this is happening, and we are happier than we've ever been, right? How's it working for us? How's it working for us? And see, as Christians, we are supposed to be different. We're supposed to be different. But we're right there, right along with the rest of our society, if we admit it. I mean, here's how the world works for most of us, right? And I alluded to this with the Carl, right? We get something shiny and new, right? Something shiny and new, and we're happy. And we start this with our kids very early, at least I did. Maybe this doesn't describe you at all. And we're happy. At least temporarily we're happy until the shiny and the new wears off. And then we get distracted by something shinier and newer. I mean, how many of you all were happy with your flip phone? Yeah, some of you all still have one, okay? I'm sorry, you, you don't fall into this category at all. And then, and then you upgraded to a phone with a camera, right? 
And then we had phones with keyboards, right? Little keyboards on them. And then they came out with phones that the keyboard just pops up on here. And now I carry a personal computer in my pocket with me. We're happy until something shinier and newer comes along. And then we're no longer happy with whatever made us happy before because now we want the newer and the shinier thing. And the problem is we can't afford it or we haven't even finished paying for the old shiny thing that's no longer shiny and new and it no longer makes us happy. And now we're sad. And it causes us to think about our financial situation which at one time we were content with. It was good or perhaps even greater. At a minimum, it was at least adequate. But now it is less than desirable because we cannot afford the shinier, newer thing that's going to make us happy. So financial problems of some level arise, or at least a financial discussion, and it leads to tension within our lives. Just describe, am I the only one? Okay, I'm the only one. I'm pastor confession here, okay? So, so then to alleviate the tension and the stress and the strain and to cope with our worry, what do we do? Retail therapy, right? We go shopping because we need to feel better now because it takes our minds off of our problems and now you don't even have to go shopping. I could stand up here and give a sermon and shop at the same time and you would never know it. And it will be shipped to my home in a day or two. Sometimes if the retailer is close enough, I can get it the same day. And some of you all are thinking, why would anybody buy clothes online? What if they don't fit? You don't care because they take them back for free. All of which alleviates all of my financial stress and my worry and my strain, right? I feel better about myself. No, it leads to more distress and more worry. That is insanity, people. Earn more, spend more, worry. Earn, spend, worry. Earn, spend, worry. That is insanity. Insanity. And then if you're like me, you want to get away from your worries, You go away for the weekend. True story. USA remains among one of the most prosperous countries in the world. And if you listen to the political landscape this last year, you heard over and over again about the 1%. And depending on your perspective, I don't want to get political on you. You thought, well, that's either a good thing or a bad thing or how. But I want you to know that if you earn more than $32,000 a year, you are in the top. 1% of wage earners in the world. And if our happiness and our contentment and our peacefulness is tied to our prosperity, then we should be among the happiest, most peaceful, content people in the world in the history of all time. Right? And we are, right? You know who the Gallup organization is? It's the people that do all the polling, you know. And the way they do it is is they call a large sample of people, okay, or they survey a large sample of people, and they say it is representative of the population as a whole. Do you know how that works? So sometimes it's really accurate, and other times it's not so much. But usually it's in the realm of possibility. So if we were to take a poll and there was 100 adults here today, This would be representative of the percentage of that. So they asked them, and they've been doing this since 2001, what do you worry about financially in your world? And then they ask questions like, do you worry a lot about this, a little about this, somewhat, or not at all? Okay, so they get these numbers. And so here's the top of the list, and they've been doing this now, I think, since 2001. Paying for unexpected medical costs, emergencies, or illness, 54% of Americans worry about this. So... We have 100 adults here today. 54 of you all are currently worrying about, do I have medical cost coming that I cannot afford due to an emergency or an illness? 54% of us, 54 out of 100, are worrying, have I saved enough money for retirement? 41% are, be- are worried about being able to pay for routine medical expenses. So 
prescriptions, going to the doctor, eye care, dental care, that type stuff. 40% are worried about not being able to maintain the current standard of living I enjoy. 35% worried about paying for kids' college. 31% en uh, having enough to pay your normal monthly bills. So one-third of United States people, again, top 1%. If you earn more than $32,000 a year, okay, you're in the top 1% in the world. 31%, one-third of us are worried about paying our monthly bills. 26%, one-quarter of us are worried about paying our rent or our mortgage almost 20% just making the minimum monthly payments. The good news is, is this all went down in the last year. Went down to more than half of us worried about money. So how's the American dream working for us? And how does this compare or contrast with our faith and values? And are we caught up in this cycle of insanity? And I'm convinced we don't have a spending problem. We don't have a debt problem. We have a contentment problem. Because we are chasing after something. We're empty. And as Christians, we believe that something is Jesus Christ. See, money in and of itself, there's no problem with that. Money is an inanimate object. Money is not evil. Desiring to earn more money so that you can provide nice things for your family. I don't ever read anything that says that's bad. Monetary wealth is not sinful. Some of the most Christ-like people who are the most generous, humble people I know are very wealthy. However... When our primary objective becomes earning more so that we can accumulate more, when attaining wealth and possessions becomes our source of worth and happiness, when that's determined by what we can buy, we replace our dependence on God with our dependence on self. We replace our dependence on God with our dependence on self. And the author of Ecclesiastes, who was most likely Solomon, who was the wealthiest and wisest man who ever lived, said he was convinced that wealth essentially has an insatiable appetite. There will be, never be enough, and you will never be satisfied. The problem's not earning or spending. The problem is contentment. The problem's actually greed. You read the Gospels. You read that, that Jesus taught more about money than he did about heaven or hell or sin. And I don't think the reason was because he despised the wealthy or believed that they were inherently bad people or didn't want capitalism to, to take fruit and grow or take root and grow. But rather, it's because money is most often the chief competitor for our hearts. It's why in Matthew he said, no one can serve two masters. You're either going to love one and hate the other. Eventually, your loyalty will be divided and you will have to choose. And where your treasure is, that's what has your heart. Love of money. Because it competes for love of God. You're always forced to choose. And we're consumed with greed, and greed is never satisfied. Now, whenever I say greed, most of us, I think, maybe, again, maybe it's just pastor here. Most of us say, Phew. They can't describe me. I'm just a middle-class American in pursuit of the American dream, and we couldn't possibly be greedy. Greedy people, they don't look like us. Greedy people are rich old misers who sit in their multi-million dollar mansions staring at their expensive artwork, wearing their silk pajamas, eating caviar, sipping champagne, being served by servants who will leave and go home to cold houses and starving children. That's not us, but I don't think we have an accurate depiction of greed. Because the way that Jesus defined greed, it's pretty simple. It's someone who is so inwardly focused that they honestly believe that they deserve to spend all that they have on themselves. It came to me. <laughs> I earned it. It's mine. And by golly, I'm going to spend it all on me. I'm going to use all my resources for my benefit to make me happy because God wants me to be happy. That's what Jesus was actually talking about whenever he told the story about the man 
who earned so much that he didn't have a place to store it all. So what did he do? He went out and he rented storage buildings to store more of his stuff so he could enjoy it. And Jesus said, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth. They're going to pass away. Truth be told, most of us don't worry about doing without something we need. Most of us either worry about something we've already consumed or we're worrying about not being able to buy the stuff we want. And worry has nothing to do with our need and everything to do with our greed. So let me get to the biblical biblical principle of stewardship. It's all God's. It's all God's. And God's generous enough to let us enjoy it while we're here. But it's not all ours to enjoy and spend on ourselves. And we're just kidding ourselves if we think we really own anything anyway. Author of Ecclesiastes said, you brought nothing into this world, and that's what you'll take with you. So my question is this, if you can't take it with you, what good can you do with it while it is yours to use? You spend more time worrying about money, worrying about earning money than you do talking to God. Are you caught in a cycle of insanity? And if this is the true of your life, what steps do you need to take to break the cycle? Are you an effective manager of the resources God has placed within your hands? Good stewardship is not a matter of spending or saving or consuming. Stewardship is a matter of the heart. So who or what has your heart? My purpose is not to make you feel guilty so that I can pull a bait and switch and trick you into giving more money to the church so that we can fill up our coffers because I don't want something from you. And I don't think God wants something from you. I think God wants to give you something. God wants something for you. He wants you to have peace. And he knows that chasing after all of that stuff, which encompasses the American dream, it's not going to make you happy. So if this doesn't describe you at all, my request of you today is pray for those of us that it does. Pray that we can find contentment and peace. But if this describes you, I don't want you to change anything this week. That's not what I'm going to ask you to do. All I want you to do is self-identify during this week that perhaps you're doing something that has caught you in this cycle of insanity. That's all I want you to do. Just be aware that this decision I'm making or this feeling that I'm having is insanity. And what am I really chasing after? And just ask yourself the question, who or what has my heart? How would our lives and our world change if our dream, if living the dream, was to love deeply, serve humbly, Forgive mercifully, give generously, and follow Jesus passionately. That's the dream I want.